My name is Allison Harding, and I am the Assistant Curator of Contemporary Art here at the Asian Art Museum. It's my pleasure to welcome you all to Samsung Hall tonight for a talk by artist Jakai Siriboot. Before we begin, I'd like to mention that assisted listening devices are available for anyone interested. The acoustics in Samsung Hall can be a challenge, so just raise your hand if you'd like one and we'll bring one to you. Finally, I'd like to thank the WLS Spencer Foundation for its support of tonight's program. Jakai Siriboot comes to us from Thailand. He is one of Southeast Asia's leading contemporary artists working primarily in the textile medium. Jakai's fascination with textiles and embroidery began as a child in Bangkok, and he went on to study textile design in college and graduate school in the United States before returning to Thailand about 10 years ago. Jakai is noted for producing meticulously man ma handmade tapestry and installation works that make powerful statements about religion, social and political issues in contemporary Thailand. A main preoccupation of his art is the interaction of Buddhism and materialism in modern life and the everyday popular culture of Thailand. Jakai's work has been presented in two solo exhibitions at Tyler Rollins Fine Art in New York, Temple Fair in 2008, and recently Karma Cash and Carry last year in 2010. His work has also recently been exhibited at the 2009 Asian Art Biennial at the National Taiwan Museum of Fine Arts and the Rubin Museum in New York. I'm delighted that the Asian Art Museum will have three of Jakai's textile works on view through October in Tadeuchi Gallery as part of the exhibition Here Not Here, Buddha Presence in Eight Recent Works. I hope you will all spend some time with Jakai's works while it's here at the museum. And I'm sure that tonight after hearing Jakai's talk, you'll find this an opportunity not to be missed. So please join me to welcome Jakai Siriboot. Good evening. Um, tonight I would like to take you on a trip, a short trip to Thailand to show you a side of Thailand that are very unfamiliar to most visitors, but I believe it is a, Thai, a side of Thailand that are very important, and it's a very, it's an in, integral part that has helped shape and identify um, a nation as it is today. The often conflicted role of Buddhism in modern Thai society remained um, a central theme in my work. I am quite interested in, in the way that Buddhists in Thailand adopt and shape this faith into a religion of convenience. As a non-superstitious religion, its main objective is basically to urge followers to to follow the five precepts in order to attain, to obtain the um, mindfulness, which eventually will lead to spiritual enlightenment. But the principles of Buddhism in today's Thailand are often misunderstood and misused. I think this is because there are certain rituals and superstitions from China and India. On the right, you see the god of Brahma. I mean, on the left is the god of Brahma, and the right is the god of Indra. Together with animistic beliefs that have thrived, you know, long before the introduction of Buddhism. These elements have greatly influenced the way we Thais practice our religion today. As a Buddhist myself, my goal in life is also to find my own spiritual path, but it has become increasingly 
difficult for me to live in an environment driven by consumerism and political instabilities to attain a peace of mind. I try, you know, as just like most, um, the majority of, of Buddhists in Thailand, I try to find that path of, of um, spirituality by um, meditation and by merit making. So the easiest way that one can do to make merit is to present a Sankatan bucket, which this bucket, as you see, normally contains the basic necessities that um, a monk would need in his daily life, such as food, medication, toiletries, because as you know, the monks cannot buy anything themselves, so they do rely on, on the devout's um, donations. The correct way is to go to a store and pick and choose the objects, put them in the buckets, and present it to the monk. But as we are living in, the, in this modern world, everybody seems to be really busy. They don't have time to go to a store and pick and choose. But not to worry, they have already ready-made buckets um, to be purchased. So these are all kinds of um, the Sankatan buckets that are available. And it's, it's sold everywhere. You can actually, you know, you don't have to worry about it. And once you have these buckets, you take it to the temple, a temple nearby you, present it to a monk who's always on standby. Um, he gives you blessings and the merit is made. While you're there, you may want to do some more donations by you know, um, paying for the roof tiles of a temple or um, giving money to, that goes towards the construction of a new building or a monk's quarters. And also, while you're there, you might as well just buy the products that these temples produce, such as holy water, holy ointments, holy lotions, anything you can find. So, in my work, this piece called Lucky Wear, the name comes from this ready-made brand of the buckets that are sold all over Thailand. But because in recent years, there have always been media news about the misbehavior of, um, of Buddhist monks. So I decided that I wanted to replace these items, you know, the basic necessities with items associated with sins, such as alcoholic beverages, condoms, whitening, skin whitening lotion, even uh, electric fly, you know, squatter. And th these are the things that when I go and make merit myself, I often see, well, not the condoms and all, but with the, with the electric fly squatter, you know, I mean, I mean, being a monk, each monk is required to follow about 280 some rules. And among them is abstaining from sexual activities, from killing, from partaking in drugs. And I often see monks holding this, this electric squad just going, you know, and you see hear the zap sound. And while I'm trying to make merit, I myself feel as if whether I should be making merit to this temple or not. So this piece, it is a social, you know, a, a social commentary and religious commentary, but at the same time, it kind of makes fun of me because as a person who wants to make merit, um, 
it's not going to get me that far because you know, I still have all these negative thoughts in my mind. Another easy way to make merit is to release animals into water or, you know, in terms of fish or a bird into the sky. The type of animal that you choose or you buy depends on the kind of suffering that you have. So you, could, you see all these, all, all these fishes in, in, the, um, in the fish tanks with all the different names. For example, bitter snails, if you want to relieve all the bitterness from your life, this is what you get. Turtles, because of its long lifespan, you, you know, you want, if you want longevity, this is what you buy. If you want a great leap in life, you buy a frog and release it in the water. And this is what you do. You make a wish and then release them. Once again, merit is made. So the business of religion is really thriving in Thailand because a lot of temples really rely on donations from, from the temple goes. So a lot of temples now come up with all kinds of services that will guarantee shortcut to enlightenment as well as to alleviate karma. And a lot of people, when they feel like they need to make merit, that's when they feel pretty bad about themselves, they flock to temples. Normally, they go to the famous temples with where there are maybe you know famous ghosts and spirits. So you have some temple that have famous spirits that um, will give you winning lottery numbers. Um, you, you, there are temples that you have monks performing rituals that are actually really in conflict with with Buddhist teachings, but whatever it takes, you know, to bring in the, the, the donations and the people. And there is one, I mean, there is one temple where a monk actually offers this merit making for um, all the ghosts of aborted fetuses so that for those women who have had um, an abortion may correct their karma, which is, it has nothing to do with what Buddhism is all about, but this sort of thing happens at a, at a Buddhist temple. There is one temple called Wat Mahabud, which is centrally located in Bangkok. It is famous for its ghost, Manat, which is the most, she must be the most famous ghost in Thailand. She's about 150 years old. And she's there, and her job is to, to grant you know, everybody's wishes. And this temple, it's an animus wonderland. They ha there are all kinds of, of services. And I just find it fascinating that um, you know, everybody goes to the temple, but this is what their, their focus is on, these animistic aspects of it. So, at the same temple, there is a tree trunk, long dead. It's a, it's a tree called Takian. It's a hardwood tree, but it's believed to have this type of tree is believed to have um, a ghost reside in there. What you see right there, these, these people are actually rubbing oil or any kinds of ointments onto the tree trunk to look for the winning lottery numbers. <laughs> and you should come, like, you know, really every, um, the night before the lucky draw is announced, the temple is open 24 hours. And sometimes I feel sorry for this ghost, you know, who's 150 years old, that she has to work 
even at night. So they're there praying for, asking for whatever, you know. And there are all other kinds of, of shrines, of deities. It's up to your pref preference. This is another Takian tree that, has, that was made into the boat, and I think it resurfaced, so people thought there must be some spirits in it, so they worship it again. Um, you, can, you can pick and choose whichever um, spirit speaks to you. I don't know if you can see this clearly, but right there, that's a head of a mummified baby, which is in this glass casket. This baby was about a month old when, when he died 25 years ago. His body never decomposed, so the parents donated the baby to this temple. And all around it, you can actually see coins, toys, and banknotes. So these are donations. And he must have um, given a lot of people, he must have granted a lot of people's wishes. That's why he has all these offerings. And during this time of year, every Thai men, when they reach the age of 18, they're up for military conscription. And mostly these people, these men, they are the uneducated and the poor ones because they never had a, a military training while they're in high school. So these people never went to high school. But um, the way to do it is, is that you have to pick sort of a lottery ticket, whether it's a red card or a black card. If you get a black card, then you're, you're off, and you get a red card, and then, then you're being drafted, and that's a two-year um, service. So you see a lot of these men with their family members coming to this temple asking the ghost of Menak to help them with, you know, with, um, with not getting the, the red card. Also at the same temples, you have all the fortune tellers ready for service. Normally, you know, they, they'll tell you all the answers that you want to know. And pretty much the lottery numbers as well, because, you know, in, in this modern time, I think a lot of people, they're so, they don't have the patience to do good deeds and wait for, for you know, their consequences to happen, if not in this life or next life. They just want to have a better life they want to get rich quickly. So right there are also lottery vendors. So you can just, you know, you ask the gods, you ask the ghosts, and then you can buy the lottery off hand. This piece I did a couple years ago is called Emotional Distortions. It was based on an interpretation of dreams for about six months, I recorded every dream that I was able to remember the next morning. And during that time, I also went to this temple a lot, praying and, and you know, I forgot to say that I am the biggest animus ever. I pray to everything, you know, trees, roadside shrines, whatever. So regardless of where I was educated, my background or whatever, it's so deep in grain. And so after six months, after going to this temple every, every, every week, suddenly one day, one night, I dreamt of, an, of two numbers. Um, I woke up, remembered, and then went out and I bought a lottery number. And I missed it by one number. But that was like, um, that was like a $20 prize, you know? But um, anyway, so I don't, know how to, I don't know how to explain it, but I think when there is such a strong belief and there must be a connection between, you know, this, this earth and the rest of 
the world. So for those men who didn't quite make it, who weren't that lucky, they were drafted. The next thing you do if you were drafted into military service is then you go to a temple or you go to um, an amulet market to buy talismans or amulets. This is another, um, another superstitious element of Buddhism that I am quite interested in. Originally, the purpose of an amulet, an amulet is normally made of um, clay tablets depicting an image of a Buddha. And its main purpose really is to remind people of, of his teachings, you know, the principles of Buddhism. But often it has evolved over the years and now there are all kinds of amulets some depicting some revered monks. Um, some are made of animal parts, like hair, um, fangs, or, or um, nails. Um, these amulets now, p people believe, they possess some nat supernatural powers. They can have protective powers. They can also bring you wealth. You can, you know, do all kinds of things. They can also bring you love. So the ones that have proven to be um, special in a way, in you know, to have to possess this power, it can fetch like a million dollars just just for its power. And how do you know whether a certain amulet, a certain make? has special power. You read the news, and often you see these gangster who was, who had been in sort of like an attempted assassination and he survived. And all the reporters always asked, what were you wearing? So once he said, this is what I was wearing, everybody flocked and, and the price of that amulet just would go up and it would be highly collected. So these are all types of amulets. There are, there's this famous amulet market in Thailand where you can basically get any, buy anything, anything that would work for you. You know, um, there are talismans that will, like as I mentioned before, that will bring you love, bring you luck, bring you lots of money. But I have to say that before these objects can be, can possess a supernatural power. It needs to be activated by a monk's blessing. Even the monk over there isn't buying and collecting as well. And I think he hopes one day that, he'll be, that he will be highly revered. But as I, you know, like all things, every object, every object, you know, have evolved. Right now, other than the image of a Buddha, I'm sorry, there, these are likeness statues of revered monks. Some still alive and some already deceased. They come in all sizes and shapes. So these are all, you know, all the, all the revered monks that are now deceased. So for this piece, I bought all these amulets from the same market. It's made, it's called Somdet, based on the type of amulet, which is Somdet Warakang. It is considered to be the most expensive amulet ever in Thailand. But these ones, they have no value because they weren't the type or the make. Um, so these were just an object, you know, that they were pretty much discarded. I bought each of them for, for 
let's say, 10 cents. And so I wanted to use these, these images of, you know, that are recognizable and actually to, to create my own um, talisman. And I think everybody, because everybody t seems to forget that the purpose of these amulets is to remind you of his teachings and not, and not to be so focused on the value of it. And by putting these same amulets in repetitive patterns, for me, is just to remind people of that. This is a store, you know, that specializes in Buddha statues. So this is my version. It's a knitted Buddha. They're all knitted and then dipped in wax. Um, they're very light and hollow because I wanted to, to take um, the wrong notions that people are now so involved with and then just to leave the shape a bit of, of the Buddha itself and again just to remind people of, of what it's supposed to be. There is another kind of of talisman called yantra. It is so like a sacred cloth. Um, it comes in all kinds, all, all shapes and sizes as well. Normally, a monk will make this sacred cloth and they will give out to people who make donations to the temple. Some will bring love, some will bring happiness, some will bring wealth, because it seems like these are the things that we all want. Um, mostly, like the crocodile one here, is for commerce. So you walk into every store in Thailand, and this is what you see. You see these amulet, um, this yantra, just maybe framed and hung on the wall. So I decided I should make my own. So I've used all these discarded fashion accessories that really were in fashion for a week and then after that out of fashion and they were just selling it for you know again 10 cents and and i wanted to use use these these objects and incorporate it into into my piece into my yantra um, just to signify the the commercialized aspects of it, because as in everything else, you know, it's in fashion for one week and it's the next week it's gone. Same with, same with religious objects. We've had that problem so many times. This is another, another yantra piece. This one, is another yantra. I, it's based on a, this book. It's a mantra, actually. On the cover, it says, how to be successful quickly. And so people bought it because they thought I mean, there must have been some really special yant you know, mantra that when they chant and they pray, they're going to become successful overnight. But in fact, all the writing in there, you know, we already know it. It's it said that you have to work hard, you have to be honest, you have to give it 100%. So this is this is my you know my other version. This one is a real a real sacred cloth. Um, people who has this will eventually attract you know, the love of their life. Um, you will also help with, with um, wealth and all that. But just imagine that this piece of cloth was designed by a monk who needs to be abstained 
from all sexual activities and all desires. So I can't really imagine what he was thinking when he was doing this. But it seems to be a very popular one, this, this, this one. You see it everywhere. Again, I have no idea what the horse and the woman, you know, why it's there, but, and I haven't tried, I don't know whether it will work or not. So this is my own version. Another superstitious element that we see all the time in Thailand is the spirit house. The spirit house is usually a place where the guardian spirits or house spirits reside. You would place this sort of structure in a compound in front of your house. Um, and inside resides probably some gilded icon, but in this case, it's um, a grandfather and grandmother. This sort of, this sort of um, spirit house actually, um, originally the purpose of it was that it was built, you know, with, with, with the grandparents in you know, the older, they had some elderly figures in it. The purpose of it was for for the young ones, every time they go out to work and every time they come back, they have to pay respects. So it kind of, the purpose was, of it was to teach people to be respectful to elderly. But again, it has sort of evolved into something else. This spirit house here was in the middle of a community with full of merchants and you know, it was, they were all shop houses around it. And so when the lease of this property was up, they actually tore down all the buildings. But then nobody dared touch the spirit house right there because they were afraid that the spirits were gonna come after them for evicting them. So you see all, kind, all, all kinds of things in in, in Thailand that people often think it's, it's just, you know, a cultural landscape, but this is really our version of Buddhism that it really should not be. So I decided to make my own version of Spirit House. Um, I put some dead babies in there they're just, you know, dolls from a market, plastic dolls, and then I put, I put gold leaf on it. And I wanted to, to see how I can take this structure that has one specific meaning and take it out of that space, that environment, and bring it on into another environment like a gallery. And it was, it was really interesting to see how people do react because a lot of Thais, when they saw it, um, they really felt that I shouldn't have done it. I might have, because I might have offended the spirit somehow. But then for, for other people who've never who are not familiar with it, they, you know, they just thought it was just a piece of art, which it was. But I had it in my house for, for, for a while before shipping it to New York last year. And even I got scared coming home at two o'clock in the morning after like lots of wine, I was like, okay, you know, please the spirits, let me, you know, let me in the house. Um, also the spirit house has a place on the street and roadside highways to often to indicate dangerous spots or maybe it was re erected there because there had been an accident and somebody died there. And the animals that you see here are sort of guarding the place. This particular one with the zebras 
there are offerings from people who, whose wishes have been granted. Um, other roadside spirits, spirit house would have chickens or a deer, depending, I don't, I don't know how, you know, how it got there, but I guess once people, once their wishes have been granted, they, then they start to buy these things and place them there. And, and then you see there are like hundreds and thousands sometimes, I mean, just all lined up on the street. So then again, I decided I might as well just make one. And then I breed, so I breed a deer and a zebra, and this is what I got. But the mutation here sort of signifies the state of Buddhism in Thailand as well, how it has evolved, how it has mutated into something differently. And then I invited people to put gold leaf on these, on these rabbits, um, hoping that maybe with a lot of faith and a lot of belief, maybe this object might actually you know, become a holy object itself. And this is where art imitates life. This is another common sight that you see in Thailand. Any big trees, large trees, um, especially a Bodhi tree, a fig tree, or um, a ficus tree, it is also believed that there are spirits reside in the tree, so people would come and pray to it, and then they would wrap around these, these colorful fabric. So a couple of years back, we had a problem on our street. Um, I live in, on a street where there are all these old trees, you know, like 50-year-old trees, and the city officials, the Bangkok Metropolitan, wanted to beautify the street. But what they mean by beautifying the street is they have to cut down all the trees, widen the street, and then replant with, you know, a tree that's tall. So we really, we really protested. The whole, the whole community got together and we we went to the governor, we went to all these officials, and they weren't listening. So we decided to ordain the trees by wrapping every tree with all these colorful fabric as well as a monk rope. And I'll tell you, they never came back because they were so afraid that they were gonna cut, they couldn't cut down these trees. So, I mean, sometimes, you know, these. 21st century problems, I mean, it needs to be solved with some like ancient solutions. But my really concern is with how Buddhism now is often misunderstood. So the type of work that I create, I want to create a dialogue, you know, to, so that viewers will actually question and then, and then try to get back to the basics of it all, which is quite simple. The Buddha is the Buddha. He represents his teachings, and his teachings, you know, is the philosophy of life, is a way of life, and there's, that's, that's all to it. With this piece, Red Buddha, I wanted to really embellish this image to over decorate it because a lot, of, a lot of times we're so concerned with the surface without, and we tend to forget, you know, what's really important. We, we're so focused on the surface without going deep down. So behind that image, I want people to really question it and then go deep, go deeper and, and, and find the answers. Whereas 
recession, I decided to take the Buddha out of the Buddha, but surround the Buddha shape with all these alphabets that come from my daily chants. So as a Buddhist, you know, I try my best, but I, um, I approach it in a very cynical way. So I've, I've decided to do this other project called Reciprocity, which is sort of like an interactive project, which I've also done at the museum a couple of days, you know, also today. I've asked people to, to write down their bad karma or their good deeds, because I think it's very important for people to actually acknowledge their suffering or acknowledge what and how they want their life to be. And the simple act of writing can actually bring profound results. And I want people to really understand, you know, to go back to the basics, rather than to be so focused on the superstitious aspects of it, like this woman praying to the god of Brahma. This piece depicts the Cambodian Prime Minister Hun Sen and our infamous ex-Prime Minister Thaksin. These are the, the two biggest animists. I mean, they're politicians, you know. These are the people, well, one is still running the country and one is, you know, used to run a country. And I really think that the way we are so deeply rooted in animistic belief have really defined and sort of stops the country's progress in this world because I don't understand, I don't, you know, even like I said, for me, I mean, how can you go far when you're still like praying to the, to the trees and um, you know, the roadside shrines and all that. To get back to um, the street, I have another actually story to tell. So after the, you know, all the officials decided to leave these trees alone, but it was such a nice tree-lined street that now everybody came to park their cars and go to work. And at the end of the day, they would dump all their garbage onto this road. And I really thought hard about maybe I should bring my spirit house and put it on the street. But I thought if somehow that spirit house starts to possess some natural power, supernatural power, and start grabbing people winning lottery numbers, I mean, then I would be really in trouble, you know, because I'll get more <laughs> visitors. I would not have peace at all. So this is the famous Air One Shrine, you know, that's the Brahma there. In the back, you can see the burned down building of Central World, which is, which is burned down during the um, political unrest last year. Normally, all these protests, you know, in the past 25 years, they have always been they have always taken place in the, part of, in the old part of town. But because um, ex-Prime Minister Thaksin and his, his people, the red shirt protesters, they always consult fortune tellers and monks and all. And this is where, this is an, a busy intersection. This is where all the glitzy malls are, all the best hotels, all the best shopping malls are. Not only Brahma is here, there's the god of Indra over there, and there are Ganesh and you know, all kinds. So this is what people call the intersection of deities. And so they decided that they need to come and protest here because if they can, if they can um, fight with the gods, then they can actually win. And so this is how it happened. You know, they, when they had that crackdown, they decided to, to burn that building down. And so I'd like to end this 
talk about this image recently. I don't know if you can see it, but it's actually a brand new Rolls Royce, big one, and with police motorcades. I was at a, at a hospital, um, and I saw this, this car waiting outside, parking outside, and I thought, okay, I really want to see who owns this car, who needs to bring all the police motorcade and all that. I thought it could be some politician or you know some billionaire. And I waited and I waited and walked in. It was a young monk, 33 years old, highly revered, I guess, by all the billionaires and by all the politicians. Got in the car and drove away. So, I mean, it's pretty ridiculous, but this is the way it is. And I just wish that if people can actually really go back and, you know, to the basics again, to the principles of what it's all about. And really, I think eventually there is, you know, a spiritual path to enlightenment. So that's it. Thank you very much.